I'm Bob Sutor, I'm a Vice President in IBM Research, and I'm responsible for the part of our IBM Q Quantum program that uh, deals with our strategy, and I think most important, building up our ecosystem, the people who really are going to be using quantum computers, in particular our quantum computer over the next few years. Uh, this is a prototype model of a 50 qubit uh, quantum computer, uh, IBM Q. And uh, really, if you look at all of this beautiful hardware, uh, it's all in support of what really happens down here at the very bottom. Here. The, the qubits, the actual quantum computer, live down there. And the rest of this, um, as beautiful as it is, and it's an engineering marvel, uh, has to do with uh, getting it cold enough, it's superconducting technology, getting the signal all the way from outside down to the, ch the chips itself, and then back up in a clean enough way. Um, and um, so we, we, we filter it to decrease the number of errors. And, and Bill, why don't you talk a little bit more about the components here to actually sure. you know, work on that signal. Sure. My name is Bülent Kurdi and I am in charge of the IBM Quantum Engineering in Almaden Research Center. So we have very close relationship with our colleagues in New York County. And as Bob indicated, the whole idea is to take the chip to a very low temperature, approximately 15 millikelvin, colder than space. Now we're interacting with a chip that's at a temperature colder than space, but our journey starts at room temperature. So our signals have to originate from room temperature, go through several stages of cooling here, and we need to modify that signal, amplify it at places, we need to filter it at places, and we need to take that signal, which is at about five gigahertz range, through coaxial superconducting cables. And then finally we reach to the heart of the quantum computer at that lowest temperature. And then challenges to bring back that signal to the room temperature and do a computation with it. As Bob indicated, at that temperature, we want that state to be long-lived, long coherence. We want it to be staying in that stage. But when we come from outside, we disturb it. So that's the beauty of quantum. Keep it long enough in a coherent state to do the computation and solve all the engineering problems <laughs> to go from room temperature to the space and back again. Right. That's right. Uh, when it is operating, uh, it's about 4 Kelvin up here at the top. And it goes down, as Bulan said, to uh, 0 0.015 Kelvin. Uh, so I'm a mathematician. Let me say this right up front. So I don't come from physical sciences. Um, uh, and I'll tell you one thing I, I learned here. These, these pretty little loops here are, are not just here to be pretty. Um, um, it does make it look very nice, though. As this gets colder and colder and colder, the metal contracts. And so the loops tighten up. Um, I live in northern New York. Uh, you see these loops on telephone poles so that the electrical cables don't snap when they get really cold. It's the same idea here. Uh, but really, uh, you know, as we said, it's all in support of the quantum computer, which is down at the bottom. Now, what's inside the silver thing? So, in a uh, in a working quantum computer, and uh, remember, this is a model, and we don't open that up, so it's not here. Would be a circuit board that would contain the circuitry for qubits. A qubit is the analog to a classical bit. So in a classical bit, we deal just with zeros and ones. And we put eight bits together, we get a byte, we take a million of those, you get a megabyte, so forth and so forth. Qubits are radically different animals. Um, they are built on the principles of quantum mechanics. Um, while a classical bit is just zero or one, one way to think of a qubit is it has two full extra dimensions of, of mathematical variability to compute with. And the qubits can all work together in different ways. Algorithms in a quantum computer are radically different from the way anybody works in classical computers today. Can you give us a sense of uh, some of the types of problems you can address in quantum computing? Well, a lot of the early applications um, are focused on chemistry, and there's a reason for that. Uh, in the early 1980s, Richard Feynman, uh, a professor at Caltech, basically observed that classical digital computers, um, and by that I mean things that are now in your smartphone, your laptop, your desktop machines like that, are really lousy approximations to the way that nature works. 
And so if you want to compute with nature, such as chemistry, and chemistry underlies uh, biology and drug discovery and material science and things like that, you need a computing model that is much more similar to the way nature works, namely quantum mechanics. So let me, let me give you one example here. Um, and it's, it's of a molecule that most people know and love. It's caffeine. <laughs> right? Yeah? Everybody here? I, I'm looking around. <laughs> I can see live caffeine. One single caffeine molecule has 95 electrons. If I were to just freeze it and to look at its energy state, I would require 10 to the 48th bits. Wow. That's one with 48 zeros. So what can I compare that to? The number of atoms on the Earth are estimated to be between 10 to the 49th and 10 to the 50th. <laughs> Dang. So you need memory proportional to 1 to 10% Jesus. of the size of the Earth Jesus. to represent this simple little molecule. Wow. Now, with a quantum computer, you could represent that using 160 qubits. So here I'm talking about a 50 qubit prototype machine you can probably think there'll be improvements over the next few years. 160 is not outside the realm of possibilities. Gotcha. So we have something here in chemistry, our well-known caffeine molecule, that is utterly impossible and will be impossible to represent using classical computers, but is certainly going to happen, we would expect, in the next few years using quantum computing. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thanks very thank much. Thank you.